Good evening. Welcome to our last Wednesday in the season of Lent. Welcome to you in the room and to you worshiping over Facebook Live as well. You can click on the link on Facebook to uh, sing along to Holden. So tonight, as we wrap up this daily work conversation, uh, I'm going to be your preacher and I'll pull in some of the things that we've been learning these last few weeks a great thanks to our musicians, to the whole Kilwine family, and to Jeremy Wolitz, who's here on clarinet? Yes. Okay, clarinet. <laughs> and Cheryl on piano. Do you want to lead us in the psalm when we get to that page? You'll be the leader, and we'll be group two. We'll follow along with you when we get to the psalm. So let us worship God together.
pray. May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Let us pray. God of all our days, God of all our work, we give thanks for this gathering. Thanks for time to remember who we are in your life, in your eyes, and the work that you invite us to do in our lives. Awaken us to something new so we might see something new that you need us to do in the way that we live in our home, in our work, in our neighborhood. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've been talking about two things, your vocation and your daily work. So your vocation is shaped by your relationship with God and with others. Your vocation is more than your career. It's really who you are. You are a number of vocations in your life. You might be a parent, a friend, an aunt, a godparent. You might call your paid work your vocation if you feel really strongly that you're using the gifts God's given you and you're working for the good of your neighbor, for your community. So your vocation is who you are and your daily work is what you do. That might be paid or unpaid daily work. Your daily work is caring for a spouse. Maybe you're going to school or fixing someone's vehicle or volunteering in the fire department. Through this gathering of people in the room and online and whoever watches the service later on, God does a whole bunch of good daily work in the world, shining Christ's light through every one of you. So over these past few Wednesdays, you've heard people share wisdom from their daily work. First, you heard Cameron Kuntz set down her fast pitch softball glove, remember that night? And she talked about her God-given passion for caring for other people, her empathy uh, for people's well-being as she's to be a pharmacist. You heard uh, Marcus Luton speak about his work as a superintendent of schools, where he talked about seeing the face of Christ in the students and the staff with whom he works. Then we met Michael Stevenson, who spoke about life after work and his joy of God's gift of retirement. And then finally, Sherry Libis spoke with great grace about the sacred work of caring for family. So their honesty, every one of those people's honesty, assures me, and I think assures you, that our community will never run out of people who deeply care. There are always enough caring people in the world, always enough goodness in the world. We don't need to worry that we'll ever run out of the light of Christ in this world to outshine the darkness through your daily work. But we might wonder about other things running out. We might still worry about other things running out. Will there be enough hot dish all kinds of people worried about a couple of hours ago? Will there be enough coffee we worry about every single Sunday morning? So that's serious business. Will there be enough communion bread or will we need to use the green muffin? <laughs> Will we run out? In my vocation as a pastor, in my daily work, to be very honest, I worry about running out of something entirely different. Not coffee or bread. What I worry about running out in my daily work never runs out, but it doesn't keep me from worrying about it. As silly as it might sound, in my daily work as a pastor, and also as a mom, and a wife, and a daughter, and a neighbor, over these years, I have worried, will there be enough of me? Can you even run out of yourself? I don't know. When I show up late at school to pick up my kid, I worry, oh, is there enough of me? 
Or when I fall behind in my daily work as a pastor, I wonder, is there enough of me? Or when I find it hard to find time to sit down with my spouse so that we can grow deeper in our marriage, I worry, is there enough of me? Whenever I imagine retirement to be a slower pace of life, you who are retired, tell me how busy you are. When do things slow down? Will I ever stop worrying about running out of enough of myself to go around? I began to understand my worry a little bit more clearly when I learned my Enneagram number. Does anybody know their Enneagram number or even what that is? It's really helpful. Well, it's, it's thousands and thousands of years old, and it helps us understand our personality and our temperament. So our staff read a book not long ago, and we talked about our Enneagram numbers so that we could better understand how to work together well. And I discovered that I'm an Enneagram 5, and because I know that, my worry makes a whole lot more sense. People like me constantly worry about running out of energy in order to be attentive to the people around them. Enneagram 5s, I've learned, can serve energy, so I'm very mindful of taking Mondays off and taking quiet time every day for reflection and prayer. Rest is as valuable to me as work because it keeps me from running out. Maybe you are like that too. So I find comfort in a verse in the Bible from the book of Isaiah. This verse, confirmation friends, is Isaiah chapter 58 verse 11 for your worship notes. And it goes like this, the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. I'm going to read it again because I think it's so beautiful. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. If Isaiah is right, I believe he is, God is drawn to the parched places, the thirst gardens, to the empty springs, to the Enneagram fives, like me. This is where God shows up with a water hose, with the cloud dripping with rain. To be parched is also to be replenished by God's watery and unfailing grace. As we move through this associate pastor call process, you've probably already heard me say that this is a congregation that cares for its pastors. And I knew this before I met you because Pastor Tangen told me long before I moved into my office 15 years ago, I know it because you prefer a pastor who's not parched. You prefer one who spends time with family and alone with Jesus Christ. You assure even an Enneagram 5 that there's indeed enough of me because Christ has made me enough. And in all honest, plenty of moments when I forget and I get to I suspect you can relate to this too. There are moments when it's tough to see around the busy next day. But each day comes as it does, right? Along with God and the water hose, along with this watery promise that there's no running out of whatever God needs in the world. God's water never fails, Isaiah said. Water can fix a few problems in the world. I've learned from you. Just this last Sunday, Clara Elkins, a longtime member of St. John, turned 101 years old. Only years ago, when she was living in her home, she relied on water to fix one problem. That winter, Clara had watched the ice build up on a sidewalk by her house near a gutter. She misses nothing. So determined that her daily work that day was to clear the path for anyone who might want to walk by, nearly 100-year-old Clara Elkins had an idea. She boiled water in her coffee pot, and one pot at a time poured the water onto the ice. It only took me five pots, she explained to me with pride. 
and the ice was gone. Water filled the parched places that Isaiah wrote about in chapter 58. That watery promise of baptism sends you out to do your daily work, whatever that might happen to be. The water assures you, especially on days when you feel parched, that you're enough to do the work God needs you to do. You can't do it all because you're only flesh and bone. But you, beloved mortal, have been washed with the watery promise that claims you already as enough through God's everlasting water hose of grace by the water that never runs out and never fails. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn that also has to do with water. Thank you. 
Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand as you may. May the peace of Christ be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of Christ's peace. aren't there you're missing one so thanks to the kill ones who are here who are singing and ushering doing all the stuff so as we receive the offering know that all the gifts that you share do good and shine the light of christ in the world Let us pray. Generous God, you walk alongside us to guide the way. You fill our lives with signs of encouragement, and you show up through people. Receive our gifts of money, imagination, and labor, and transform them into a feast that welcomes all to walk with you. In Jesus Christ, our host and our guest. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks. He gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You are welcome at this meal of mercy. The Lord is the host of the meal. 
you can come just as you are. If you're worshiping online, I invite you to exchange the bread and wine among you. If you happen to be alone, then this is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. In the room, we'll commune the pulpit side first. You can come up the center aisle and I'll hand you a chunk of bread. You can take a cup of wine or grape juice from the tray that Cheryl is holding. And in the middle of that tray, the clearer juice is white grape juice. You can drop your empty cup in the tray Olivia is holding. Once you've all communed, we'll come your way after that. Come as you are.
please stand as you may. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Let us pray. Tender and merciful one, at your feast you fed us. We brought nothing, yet you turned our emptiness into joy. Filled with your abundant grace, send us now to our everyday work, walking alongside friend and stranger, mending broken hearts, working for justice, and striving for peace among all people in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Next week is Holy Week, so we'll worship on Wednesday is the cantata, and then Thursday, Friday worship is Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. All of those services are at 7, so we hope you come back for those. And also, if you didn't know already, um, the church council has hired Kayla Kilwine to be your worship and music director, beginning not until July, but I just want you to know that tonight you got a bit of a taste of the great gifts God's given Kayla to lead our congregation in terms of worship and music, so thanks be to God. Your final blessing is on the back page of the white booklets, also on the screen. Remember the poor.